Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm uh, gearing up to get this puppy rolling here. And I think we're close. Let's see here. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Dave Lowe. I'm the CEO of ISI Federal Incorporated. We are we are located um, near BWI here in Maryland. I'm hoping everybody's doing really well. We have a bunch of folks on the line today. There's several different things that I want to point out just as, uh, as kind of housekeeping things. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat and, uh, and or make sure that your audio pin is entered so we can unmute you. If you take a look at your right-hand side in your control panel, your audio pin, not 36, that's mine, but your audio pin, Plus the uh, plus the pound sign will give you the ability for me to be able to unmute you. I cannot unmute you if you don't do that. So uh, we'll kind of remind you of those things. But feel free to ask questions throughout the uh, the presentation, and we will do our best to be able to get that to you. We don't have any special guests today, but uh, just give you an idea of what we're about here. We're located near BWI, as I mentioned before. Some of our clients are are big guys like Northrop, and and uh, we, we run the gamut. Uh, with those, uh, Coastal Sunbelt is another large client. We also have smaller clients like Baltimore Mediation, Roni's Transportation. Uh, with the, and we'll give you some of the components of each one of those in a little bit. Uh, there are three primary clients' needs that we serve here with ISI Federal. One is that we can help the do-yourselfers the, to, to market, to plan, to help train uh, you in what happens in the federal government, uh, both from the standpoint of um, of what you need as far as the being able to get, jump through the hoops, right? The hoops that you would have to jump through, as well as some practical advice and and training on on the sales uh, the sales techniques and components. We're going to get into some of those today. We also provide uh, services to assist or augment you with the grunt work that you have to do. Any any kind of business development requires a significant amount of. Um, resources. So we can help augment those resources either by making the phone calls and scheduling meetings or managing your folks so that they can be more productive in what they do. So there's kind of two different avenues there that we, we operate in an assist mode. And the third is that we handle all aspects of federal sales. And that means outsourcing the whole thing to us. It's a bolt-on business development solution. And it, it's a we build it, you bank it. And if we're running the whole thing, we will guarantee results for your company. And, and be able to, to help you enter the, the space. Now, this is not cheap. It's not cheap if you hire somebody yourself, and it's not cheap if you hire us to do it, just to, for, for full disclosure there. About this webinar series, we are we're in conjunction with uh, Smart CEO Magazine. It's every second Tuesday of the month. Smart CEO is a great magazine, by the way. They, uh, they, they cater to the, the C-level suite uh, in, in addressing things that, that folks that are running their own business have to deal with. In this particular instance, we're talking about how to get into the federal space. We'll work through the basic elements as well as connect you with specialists and experts. Most of the time when we're, we're running this webinar, we try to attract some people, but I wound up um, not being able to do that this time, just been waiting too long. So, but we provide a forum for business leaders and specifically of how to get to the federal money. And that's what we're going to concentrate on. Everything about this is identifying your federal market for you. So we'll get into some of those pieces. As far as what you can expect, this is a fire hose session. We're going to rip right through it. We're going to, we're going to definitely give you a whole lot more than you could possibly handle. And we are not following the pack. You're, you're going to see us diverge from a lot of the things. If you're experienced in this, you'll know. But if you're starting this it, to get into the federal market, there's things that you're starting to hear from people. And we're not going to be following that instruction. We're going to be doing our own thing. And we're going to be providing you with straight talk and, and, and give it to you as straight as we can and give you help where you need it. And just in line with that straight talk, that's not necessarily where you think you need it. So we're going to dive into that in a little bit. Here's what we talk about when we're talking about help where you need it. We help you target your market, position your company, leverage relationships, and that complies with whether you want to do it yourself or whether you need a little bit of help or you want to outsource the whole entire effort to us or, or somebody else for that matter. 
we can help you with that strategy. In today's session, we're going to be talking about who are the right people, specifically who are the right people for you. And then we're going to get into how we find them or how you can find them and what we can do to help you do that. Establishing rapport, and we're going to get into some fundamental components of how people make decisions and, and specifically what you can do to position yourself with contracting officers, program managers, project managers, executives within the federal space, and, and be able to get your information in front of them, one, and two, really start to build relationships because people buy from people they like. So we're going to be talking specifically about scheduling meetings and calls because these are all important into developing the relationships and tell you what you need before you start doing this. And we have some solutions here. We're, one of the things that you can expect as well is you're going to, there will be some shameless plugs here with ISI Federal and some of our partners that I will be introducing you to potentially throughout this whole entire process. So as we're working through this, we will, um, we will, we will kind of get through those things. So just real quickly, I, I see a lot more people coming on board now, and um, I just want to welcome everybody, and, and we'll, we'll just continue on through um, get this next part. Just about the, the federal market itself. Now, everybody knows this is just a crazy marketplace. It's $425 billion. It is by far the largest corporation or customer in the world. 2.5 million contracts. And I want you to remember this number because as we're talking about contracts in the federal space, we want to make sure that you remember this because we're going to also look at Fed biz ops and some of the things that are there. 23% of these are supposed to be set aside for small business, and the feds buy everything. I mean everything. It, it, you'd be amazed at, at some of the components that, are ha that happen there um, and, and some of the pieces. So with the, the, the local, regional, and national level, it doesn't matter where you're playing. Um, just real quick, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to, to, to put them in the chat. Uh, in the in the in the position it, within the on the right hand side, um, and if you have any if you have any trouble hearing me or anything like that, please let me know because you're the ones that have to tell me. Um, there's 85,000 buyers out there. Now, what's important about that? These are people that have the ability to execute contracts for your services. Now, do all of those do that? No, they don't. But we'll talk about how to reach those folks in a little bit. They are the number one customer in the world, in the federal government. So and even if you're hearing all this stuff about budget cuts and things like that, and there will be, uh, and there's opportunity there too. So don't panic. Don't freak out. There's ways to be able to, to get into this. And, and, uh, and I just sent out, a, um, I sent out a, an update last week talking about some of the opportunities that are out there because of uh, either shakeups in the, in the way things are working or uh, where, where they don't want business as usual, and there's opportunities there as well. And here's some alarming statistics. And all these great things, 92% of the folks fail to try. 80% that have GSA schedules lose their schedule because 50% of them don't get a dime. The other 30% don't reach a $25,000 minimum. And I'm telling you, I don't know what business you're in, but that's a categorical failure in my view. So this includes also. 8A, service disabled, women owned, whatever it happens to be. Did you know that 5,000 of the 9,000 8As get zero dollars? That's just an incredible thing. When, you're, when you think about the work that goes into getting a GSA schedule or getting your 8A certification status or whatever it happens to be, to, to have these kinds of failures, most 8As graduate and then disappear. Some of them, they're banking it, they cash in, and they're like, hey, I'm going to Tahiti. And that's great. For, for the folks that are very successful, that's awesome. And, and, but most of the time, what happens is they're, they're used to running in their 8A program, and they get to the point where it's like a year before, and it's, oh my gosh, I've got to develop some other business. And it's too late. You've got to start it. If you're an 8A, you've got to start planning your transition as soon as you start poking business. Because if, if you're totally reliant on your 8A, it's going to disappear, and, and you're, you're you're going to be without anything. And the biggest thing about this is that the average cost is $55,000. For somebody to just dip their toe in and say, hey, let's try this for six months, or maybe try it for a year, 
and they try and they try, or they're doing something, they feel like they're doing something, and we'll get into that later as well, where they feel like they're doing something, but they just cannot get to a place where, um, where, where it's working. And, and so, hold on one second, I just want to make sure, hey, hey, Mark Lano's on here. Man, it is good to see you. I'm sorry I miss you. I missed you logging in. But I, I will absolutely give Mark Lano a plug. He he is he runs. Hold on one second. Wait, let me let me find you. I'm going to introduce you for real because you guys have got to hear this guy's story. Hold on one sec. You there, Marky Mark? Hey, Mark. He's he's also not a tenant, which is not a surprise. He runs he runs a firm, um, Source One. They're a tactical supply outfit down in uh, in southern Florida, just outside of Miami, and he has effectively grown his business into a hundred twenty million dollar business. He's an eight A, but only a, a small portion of his his um, his contracts are eight A. So if he jumps back on board. I want to make sure we, we get him to, to, to chime in here. So I, I lied when I said I didn't have an expert. I just didn't know he was going to show up. So uh, hopefully he can. But if you're thinking about getting into the federal space, you need to have a long-term process in being able to develop that, and we're going to address some of those things. So that you're not just dumping 55, 100, 155, 200 grand on a process that just won't work. So we'll, we'll get into those things. But if you're thinking of, of trying to do this by the end of this year, I'll tell you what. Take your money, take 50 grand, you'll save $5,000 right out, right out of the game. I'm going to save you $5,000. Go to Vegas, put it on red, and, and spin. Let it ride. Because the chances are you're going to do a whole lot better than if you're, you're trying to do it here. So ISI Federal, just a shameless plug here, is about removing the obstacles to your federal sales. Targeting, positioning your company, and leveraging things like relationships, our processes, knowledge of the marketplace in order to be able to get to the all-important win. We can talk about processes all day and talk about schedules. GSA schedules don't get you dime one. A day doesn't get you anything. The only thing that works for you is to be in the business development world when you're doing your federal stuff. So how do you win? Relationships win. That's the knowledge of opportunities before they hit the street. They may still wind up on Fed biz ops, but you have got to be playing a role before that hits the street so that you can affect the scope and influence it in some form or fashion. And there's plenty of ways to do that. We're not going to dive into that today. But we're going to talk about winnable opportunities because if you have knowledge of the opportunities and you've positively affected the scope in some way that it's leaning towards your strengths, then you're getting to a place where it's a winnable opportunity. So what is a winnable opportunity? Well. People buy from people they like. It doesn't change in the federal government any more than it changes in the private sector. If you like somebody, there's a good chance that you're going to do business with them. I can tell you this. If you don't like them, they're not going to do business. You're not going to do business with somebody that you don't like. Neither are they. So if the same things go in this point. And, and uh, if Mark ever gets back on here. You back, you back on here, Mark? Mark, you up? Yeah, I'm here. Hey, how you hey, doing, how man? You? I'm doing okay. Great. I was having a little technical challenge on the IT side, which is not my strength, that's for sure. Hey, I'll tell you what. I, I'd love to say that, that you were alone in that, but I can tell you you're not. I had, I had the whole thing rocking and rolling this last time, and it, it, was, it was a train wreck the first, the first, the first session uh, last week when we did fiscal year-end spending. I had a couple of guests. Uh, from gsaproposal.com, and I could not get them online. It, just, it didn't matter what I did. So, uh, you know, not only did could I not get them online, I looked like a bumbling in it trying to do it. So, anyway, introduce yourself, Mark. Great. I'm Mark Yano. I'm the CEO of Source One Distributors in uh, Wellington, Florida. And, and what is it that, that Source One does? Uh, we are one of the uh, prime vendor uh, contractors for DLA that supplies tactical gear for the special operations community and uh, we hold several GSA schedules as well as uh, BPAs and IDIQs with DOD EMOF. Excellent. And and that happened overnight, right? Oh yeah, I woke up and it was under my pillow. <laughs> and, 
and and just just to give you the extra plug, um, Mark, let us know. First of all, congratulations on it's the Ernst and Young Award, right? Yeah, we're very uh, very humbled. We won the uh, Ernst and Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award and the uh, the DLA Innovation uh, Small Disadvantaged Business Award last week. So so when you when you start thinking about the kind of things that I'm talking to everybody else, um, Mark is a tremendous resource. First, he's he's very knowledgeable about the marketplace. He also he also has lived it from the standpoint. Now, now a lot of people that, that get you have you're an 8A, right? We are an 8A, yes. And and you know that a lot of 8As just either fall off the face of the earth after they get it, or they never get dollar one. Why why is that? Well, you know, first of all, it is just that it's a certification, and uh, at the end of the day, uh, the 8A certification is a good entry, but it's not going to guarantee you the contract if you can't provide the uh, the commodities the customer is looking for. Right. So there, there's absolute need. There's a need for one getting having an 8A certification gets you in the door sometimes, right? But yeah, are, 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 are people going to buy? Are, are people going to buy from you just because you have it? Uh, not necessarily. It gets down to uh, relationships and pricing. Relationships and pricing, and that's where we're, we're actually on on that slide where relationship plus need equals a winnable opportunity. If you have a relationship and you have the ability, because one of the things that an 8A does for you is it is, is it helps to minimize your competitors, kind of pushes them to the side, because it, it can't it's not going to go to bid business if it's set aside for 8A. It could if they were going to. If there, if it's a, if it's a, a percentage of that, but if it's just set aside for 8A, then the big businesses don't even see it, and and neither do the regular small businesses because it it gets competed with a smaller amount of people, right? That's correct. That's right. So anyway, I'm going to keep you on the line because we're going to do this. So and that's what we're after with winnable opportunities. We're talking about minimal competition, and that means. This is astounding. 50 to 95 percent of opportunities have less than five competitors. Now, most of the time, when you're looking on some place like FedBizOps or something like that, you're going to find you know 10, 20, 30, sometimes even more than that. And let's take a look at this. We just did something for one of our clients, Showcall um, USA. They do event services, and here here you have 44,122 contracts over the course of um, I'm not, I don't remember. This could be two years, but at any rate. This is this is the number. Ninety-seven percent in event services, one point five billion dollars had less than five competitors. And these are the kind of places that we want to figure out how things are happening. And we know how things happen with that. So that's one of the things. Now, how can you get there? It comes by positioning and also understanding your federal buyer. These folks are people just like you and me, and they need things just like you and me. But I'm telling you something, it's not what you think they need. So we're going to talk about some of those things as well, So and understanding your federal buyer. So let's talk about the key decision clusters. These are the, th these are the people that are responsible for doing the purchases or facilitating a procurement within the federal government. There's three people that are involved. Sometimes there's a panel of people that are involved if it gets larger. But generally speaking, if you're talking about just everyday purchases that, that the contracting officer has something on their desk for, you're, you're, you have your contracting officer, you have your technical representative, which works, they get their authority from the, the contracting officer, and then you have your program manager, your project manager. And each one of these folks has, has different needs for what you need to be able to provide. The project manager, they make sure that the decisions are in line with the initiatives. Now, some of those initiatives are being driven by the President of the United States right on down through. And depending on the political pressure, as, as you know, back 9-11, 2000, 2001, there was a whole lot of initiatives that came very fast, and there was a whole lot of opportunities that were there that happened that were just not even available before that day. And, and then they're measured by different performance metrics, and they could be all over the map. They're responsible for finding new ideas. There are folks out there that do want to do things differently, and they want to do things new, and they are influenceable. That means that you can help them with a scope or technical requirement. And these are the people that you need to, to, one of the people that you need to know. The second person that's involved is the technical representative. They're busy, or at least think they are, and, and I don't, I'm not just busting on people, but I, out there in, 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 the, in the public eye, people think that they're just shuffling their feet and they're not doing anything. Some of these folks are very, very busy. 
and they're very active in pursuing new people. We were, we were just talking to a couple uh, contracting officers in COTARS yesterday that were very thankful that we were presenting things to them because this is where they, they really want to get an understanding of what's happening in the marketplace and look for these things. So their authority is granted from the CO. As far as the purchasing component, they, have, they, they fall under the contracting officer. However, they're usually in the program management side of things to be able to tie the procurement of this piece and, and give them technical expertise. So they are risk averse. They're not, they're not looking for bleeding edge things. They assist in assembling the technical requirements and they look to meet the standards and they look for other components that have happened in the past with different organizations. And they're also looking for, for certifications that you can help them with, by the way, and making sure that they meet the mandatory requirements. So as far as the, the decision-making clusters, we missed the contracting officer. Let me tell you about the contracting officer. They're the yellows there. The, yellow, the contracting officers, they're responsible for doing the procurement. They're, they move paper all day long. Their job is to procure things. It is not to know about what you do, and they really don't care what you do. They really want to know, can you fill the T's and C's of this contract? Do you have the certifications that are required? Do, can you help me minimize the competition? Because guess what? They don't want 50 responses any more than you want 50 competitors. So what happens is these people get together. They're responsible for executing the contract and actually running the contract after it's awarded. Sometimes it gets shoveled off to some other folks within the agency, depending on the size. But generally speaking, they're also responsible for administering the contract. So you have these decision clusters where you have these three groups of people, and they hang out. But from time to time, these people all come together to, to form a group that, that I like to call a decision cluster. And the way that is, is it's a, it's a particular need. And if you think about your world and what you supply, in your, in your instance, Mark, you're talking about uh, tactical supplies. Now, that could, be as, that could be as simple as, hey, somebody needs 100 holsters, or somebody needs, hey, we need all kinds of stuff that, that's going to be awarded in an IDIQ that's, that, could be, that could have a multi-million dollar limit. So those types of things, are, are, or BPAs as well. So these types of things are, are where these people get together and say, we need to, to fulfill this need that, that we have within the agency. And these, kind of, these guys kind of get together, and then it gets assigned. Eventually, it gets handed off to the contracting officer, where then all communication has to stop. And, and, uh, and you can't talk to the PM. You can't talk to the CO about that particular project um, or the COTAR. So this is your particular project. And these clusters are, are all over the place. They start getting developed, and they, and they move around. Some, sometimes the contracting officer that, that handled it the last time doesn't do it this time. And sometimes you have a different program manager or project manager as well. So they're constantly moving, and they're constantly forming. Now, these key targets, and we'll look at Department of Transportation. You can see uh, FAA, FHA, some of the other organizations that fall as subgroups to the Department of Transportation. These groups and clusters start to develop. And we start to look at the people that are involved and the number of contracts that, they're, that they do. Because the ones that do it on a regular basis are the ones that bubble to the top. And this is public information. Now, you can find it, but it's not exactly the way that you think it should be. But these types of things come to the top, and you start looking at these people and say, wow, this guy's got 13 contracts for $13 million. That's an average of $13 million. I mean, a I mean, million dollars a piece. That's a good size. Maybe too big for you. You may be much better off with six contracts at 337000 So you start to look at some of the places where you would fit in best with what they are. So find the people that need to find you and need to like you. Because if you, that, that's the first step in any of your winnable opportunities. And then help them like you by giving them what they need. Now, what do they need? Uh, this is your contracting officer. Uh, your contracting officer, the people that you're going you're to be marketing to some of the time, they're busy, or they think they think they are. They will not teach you how to work with them. And I apologize. I'm going backwards, but I'm going to do it because I might have missed something. They're also risk averse. Their job is to move paper from one side of the desk to the other. Is to make that award. That's their whole entire job. They don't care about what they about what you do particularly, other than being able to provide them with cover. They need. They select the purchasing mechanism, so that can be an RFP. It could go out to RFP. If that's the case, it's going to take months to be able to fulfill. 
They may use a BPA that's, that is tied to your GSA numbers or some other contracting vehicle with another agency that's pre-competed. So, or they may just buy straight off of your GSA schedule, like Mark was saying. It, you, you go to DOD Mall, bam, you can point and click and buy stuff. And the same thing can happen also with IDIQs, which is indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity. These are, these are not guaranteed anything. BPAs or IDIQs are not, they don't guarantee that you get any money, neither does the GSA. The RFP, if you're awarded, usually you're going to, that's yours, and that's a contract. Sometimes the RFPs are for IDIQs or GWACs or something, and you become on a short list. But generally speaking, the objective is still to work these contracts to their maximum potential even after you get them. So they are responsible for developing the contract requirements, the FAR acquisition requirements, uh, the federal acquisition requirements. These are the legal components. Very important to get your CPA and your lawyer involved when, it, when you start doing these things because you're, these, these things are very, can wind you up in the pokey. Um, and establishing the process for what the procurement is going to be. They are after the fastest way to purchase, and that is critical for you when you're doing this. Okay, I'm going to go run through the top 10 contractor officers do. We did this a couple months ago, but I'm going to do it again because I like it. First thing is to get organized so you can track your progress. If you can get introduced, that's the best way, if possible. But if not, call them anyway. Make your introduction. Do call them before you send them anything. Pick up the phone and say, hey, you know, I'd like, to, I'd like to talk with you. I just want to make sure you know that I'm real and, and, and I'm going to send you some stuff. Develop a short to-the-point introductory email when you're doing these things as well. We can help with those pro that process. Have a one-page capability statement. We went through this last month. If you go on isifederal.com, you can see a bunch of samples of those. Just click on our clients and you'll see some of those follow very specific rules that we, that we have for, for being able to pitch to both the contracting officer and the other. And, and the other folks. Um, find out their procured, their preferred procurement method. If they like using a GSA, give it to them. If, if, you, don't, if you can, give them, give them that. If not, figure out how they like to do it. They may, they may your G, use your GSA numbers to develop a BPA because they'd rather do it in their own house and have control. Do you do ask them when you should follow up? This is an interesting thing. Every one of these folks that are out there have their own desires of when they want to be followed up on. And it's not going to be every day, I can tell you that. It may be once a week, once every two weeks, once a month, once every two months. Some, some people may say, call me at once a quarter. Whatever that is, do it and be faithful with it and make sure that you have it in your system to be able to do exactly what they're asking you to do because they will judge you on your ability to follow through on small things. So show consistency and persistence, very, very important to continually do it. I know it sounds like it could take forever, and it might. Some of these people may take two years before they actually respond to you or actually give you a shot. Stay with it. Don't let them off your target list. If they are primary people that are buying what you sell, do not leave it to your competition to eat your lunch. And then do what you find out how to help them. Do what you can to find out. Uh, outside of what you do, it's so interesting because it was before I, I met Mark, I was talking with, um, with an outfit. It was a VA's office in West Virginia, and we were talking about specialty tools. In a former position, she bought specialty tools, and I'm talking very niche-oriented tools. I said, well, what do you do now? And she said, well, I'm responsible for other things. And I, I said, well, what do you have on your desk that you can't move? And she said, I, I need, like, like police belts and holsters and handcuff holders and stuff like that for our, for our security detail. Now, this is a VA hospital in West Virginia. I wasn't expecting that. And I looked through my Rolodex and I said, hey, call her. She needs what you do. And the next thing you know, by the end of the day, boom, somebody inked a deal for a couple of hundred holsters and things like that. And I'm sorry, Mark, because I didn't know you at the time. <laughs> but um, And then do ask for an in-person formal debrief. You will lose. If you're doing responses and proposals, you will lose, I guarantee it, and this is a great way for you to be able to get to know the contracting officers, how they start to make their decisions, and the people in the procurement process, so that you can do better next time. It's about improving. Our process that we use is called Limerick, where we leverage, we influence, we monitor, we respond, we 
improve and we capture. That's the process to be able to, to, to build your federal business. So there's a bonus one. Remember what they do for a living and help them make their job easier. And the super bonus is have a second capabilities with a scope of work and BPA verbiage, whatever it is that they like to use, so that they can use it, cut and paste that into their next RFP document. How much better would it be for you if you were responding to your scope and not somebody else's? And it's immeasurably better. So here's the don'ts. We'll run through these real quick. Don't pester them. Don't forget what they do for a living. And don't tell them you pay taxes, they work for you. And you think that's crazy, but there are people that absolutely go into this with their guns blazing saying, hey, I'm the best. I know I'm the best. If you could just open your stinking eyes and take your, you know, get your C&I dog to see it, whatever it happens to be. Don't send them complicated technical information. If you're talking to the contracting officer, these people don't care about your stuff. Don't tell them you will, don't tell them you will win the bid and that, or you will actually go to them, you will bid, and then not send one in. If they're asking you to bid, bid. Even if it's not the best numbers, whatever it happens to be. Don't tell them that you're going to bid and then not do it because that could get you blacklisted from their, from their list. Don't be late on your proposals. These folks are looking for the easiest way to disqualify just about everybody. And that's, if you're one minute late, you've lost. There's no, there's no two ways about it. Don't call them in September for the first time. And I'll add, don't call them from the middle of August for the first time. We're in the middle of multiple blitzes with our, with our new clients that, we're, that we have. And we're, we're in doing introductions to these folks. And as we're introducing these, these folks, we know that come the end of July, they're going to start to dri drizzle off. Some of them are going on vacation. By the middle of August, these people start to disappear. By the time it's September, they're not reachable unless you already have a relationship and you're doing follow-ups. That can work. We do follow-ups then, but we don't do, the, don't, we don't do introductions from, from the middle of August on. Don't stop calling even if they haven't given you a chance. Make sure that you're dripping on them on a regular basis. Don't call them stupid idiots, morons, etc. if they choose somebody else. It happens all the time. People are throwing in protests. Protests are usually not one, by the way. And, and they never get one if you just go in with your guns blazing saying they're idiots. And don't protest unless you have grounds based on process. So there, you, if you're new to this industry, learn how to do it and give yourself appropriate time to be able to do that. Whoops, that's somebody else. Um, the top ten bonus for the don'ts, don't expect them to marry you on the first date. You are not going to walk into them and they're going to say, my God goodness, I'm glad you showed up today. I was dreaming about you last night. It's not happening. So what do contracting officers need? They need political cover, they need technical cover, and they need pricing cover. These are the places that you can do, make your changes so that your approach, give, you, give them political cover. You can give it to them. If you know what they need for political cover, you can find it. It may be that you're doing a top-down sales technique where you're going a couple of levels up, making sure you're warming it up up top before it comes down on them. Technical cover, These, this is your capabilities, flat out. These are the pieces that, are, that they know for a fact that you can fulfill. And when you have past performance and the things like that, those are the pieces that also help with that. So pricing cover, that's where your GSA comes in. It's already pre-competed if you already have it. You, they don't have to go through rigmarole and go, and go out there and try, just try to compete and compete and compete. It doesn't matter. You've already competed. It's all, your numbers are already blessed by GSA. Or if you don't have GSA, you may have some other contract vehicles that could be used government-wide. Oftentimes, it's just a checkbox. When they, do, when they put that contract into the system, many contracts are actually capable of being used across the rest of the government. So make it easy for them. And that means wrapping it up for them in a nice little present with a bow and giving it to them, making it easy as possible for that. And easy is not what everybody else is doing. The folks that are out there, this is what I call the freeway, because it, it doesn't cost anything to do these things. The odds, the boost. Important people, yes, but they don't have a de decision-making capability at all. Fed biz ops, where everybody is. The NAICS notifications, you can get these for free. And, and I know for a fact that Mark ha has these things. He's monitoring these things all the time. Should you monitor? Yes, you should absolutely monitor. Absolutely monitor everything. 
However, that's not where your relationship comes from. That just says, hey, ping, there's something out there, and, and definitely want to monitor those things. If you have a full and open RFP, which is out on FedBizOps, there's lots of competitors, there's lots of bid responses, there's political exposure a lot of times. Some of these get into the almost billions of dollars now. I was with a staffing company, and they're bidding on a $900 million project. Where they, and, and they already, they're an 8A, and they're, 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 they have some good track records. They're, they're growing like crazy, but that, that's, that's a big thing. It has a lot of exposure from all the big players, so there's a lot of political exposure as well. There's months of work that are associated with that. Oftentimes, when you get down to the end and you start doing your teams and you're assembling your technical documentation, I mean, that is just an entire month of just sopping multiple resources and a long sales cycle of, of 8.3 months on average. So the way that we view FedBizOps is like this. Everybody is trying to get in to the same thing at the same time. And, and remember what we talked about with all those. Is that easy for them? Is it easy for the people that are buying? Is it easy for you to do this? Of course not. Is, is it profitable for you? No, it's not profitable either. So when you start talking about this, the, the, normal, the enormous market that's out there, we, we kind of touched on this earlier, 85,000 buyers. Here's one of the things I'm going to launch into a plug for something that we do and knowing your market and help where you need it. And, and this is a commercial, so you can zone out if you want to, but I'm telling you don't. ISI Federal Intelligence that we do gets the information that, for these people, the contracting officers primarily. And it's your, it helps you to develop your plan to find the right people in the right agencies to, and, and even find your competitors' contacts. It's all public information. We just distill it in a way that nobody else does. And then we have a federal blitz that we, that we have. Right now we're doing it. I can tell you if you sign up, it's, it can still be effective, but we're really looking in your blitz. If you sign up now, we're going to be looking for um, a little bit later in the year. Uh, regularly, that's 447. We do it today for our webinars for 3870, and and you can you can save from that. So as far as knowing the people, these are the key contacts for what you do in your business, and and the people that are spending the money, and in the agencies that are buying. And I don't care about forecasts, by the way. Forecasts don't do a thing for me. They're worse than weathermen, especially with the budget things that are happening. What we know for sure is people that do buy these things now are the ones that are going to protect their turf and maintain that buying that they've been doing. Right now is the right time to be doing this. The number of contracts, these are all September, you see the spikes? These are all September spikes. That's why we do our blitzes now. We make sure that we're in front of people. We, we're repositioning, reintroducing capability statements. We're reintroducing our people that, we, that, that we've dripped on and making sure that they, they know who we are. Because if not, they're going to be going to the path of least resistance. And if you're not it, they're going to choose your competitor. We can't have that happen. So again, help where you need it. That's what we're doing today as far as, as specials go. Here we're going to start to get into the process of how people make decisions. And this is, this is all across the board in establishing rapport. Rapport is, we, we, did you know that people start to dissect you when you introduce yourself within 1.5 seconds. Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book called Blink. If you haven't read it, it's a, it's a good book. I'd read Tipping Point first if you haven't read that, and then read Blink because he starts to talk about how we, how we process information naturally as human beings. And it's called thin slicing. We, cut, we, we gather the information. We start to say, OK, is this one of the good guys or is this one of the bad guys? First thing. Is this guy just a pain in my butt? Does he sound just like everybody else? Or is he unique? And is unique good? Or is unique bad? So when you start to think about how we process things, if somebody picks up a phone and cold calls you on the phone, you are making decisions, bam, whether or not you want to talk to them in a matter of split seconds. So in order to be able to establish rapport, you need to know that you are a great choice for them. The only way that I know that you can be a great choice for them is if you do your research first before you start the introductory process. 93% of communication is nonverbal. That's not just something they quoted in Hitch, if, you, if you've seen that movie. 
but this is this is legit and these are the types of things with voice inflection and and also you know body posture and things like that and and we all we know these things and sometimes it's a matter of of primary representations where people are visual or people are auditory or people are kinesthetic meaning feeling and touching and we all communicate a little bit differently even even though most folks are visual and then secondary is is auditory but there's a bunch of kinesthetic people out there where if you're saying hey do you see how this works and they're thinking I I'm gonna stop feeling you it's a classic between men and women where you have you know the the, the men are men are from Mars and women are from Venus so you have this this disconnect that's happening and rapport is the essence of being able to bridge those disconnects so that the communication flows and it goes back and forth so 93 percent of this is 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 nonverbal, and this includes on the phone. If you're not listening to me now, you found me boring. And it's because I am not delivering the way that I should or the way that I could to be able to meet your responses. Now, by the same token, if you are listening to me, there's a reason. It's because we're touching on things that are important to you and that resonate with you. And the same things happen on the phone calls, introductory phone calls on the things that you can say and the things that you can do. So one of the things that we do is we act as if. We act as if we know you. We act as if we're friends. And these are the types of things that we're going to go through right now. If you're picking up the phone and talking to somebody, do you want to be introducing, hey, Mr. Johnson, this is Dave Lowe. I really appreciate the time that we, you know, you're spending the time with me to talk. Yeah, that's very cordial, very nice. But do you, wouldn't you prefer to have a response like somebody that knows you? So act as if you know them. Act as if they're good people, and they're the kind of people you want to hang out with. This all happens before you pick up the phone. Act as if you're on the same side. How often do we go into a sales thing, or how often do you hear salespeople and sales trainers talk about the adversarial roles of get their pain and feel their pain and, and then start smacking back and forth, and then it's a tennis match, back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. I would much rather dance than wrestle. I'd much rather know what they need and be able to connect those dots. We're working on the same page. That's what we're after. And then act as if you're already good friends. One of the things that came out several years ago is, is, is Harvard Business Review did a, did a, um, a survey of buyers in, in Fortune 500 companies. And only 3% said that the people acted too familiar. The rest of it, they don't understand my needs, they don't listen, they're arrogant, whatever they happen to be, of why, why, why they don't like salespeople. Only 3% said they, they acted too familiar. I'll take the 97% all day long. Now, there's some people that I'm following up with with emails where they'll say, I don't even remember you. Of course, we talked maybe a year ago or a year and a half ago, and we're following up just trying to, trying to, trying to stay in touch. And, and they say, pound sand. Okay, I'm okay with that because they may be fe feeling like I'm, I'm acting too familiar. I'll take that all day long because there's thousands and thousands and thousands of people that will not feel that way. So act as if they're already good friends. Now, in scheduling a meeting or a call and picking up the phone, do your homework. Those pieces that we're, that we're talking about, make sure your targeting is right. If your targeting is right and you know these people are buying what, what you sell, and they say, I really don't have application for that, or I don't ever see anything like that, and you're looking, you're looking that they, they, they signed 20 contracts last year. You know they're not telling you the truth. You haven't earned the right to be able to, to be in their inner circle and being able to be in there. But if you do your homework and you know they're good targets, they never lose that target unless they retire, in which case I want to talk to them. So know your target. Know how they think. What is their buying preferences? Are you speaking their language? Have your value proposition ready. And your value proposition to, to a program manager is, here's my bullet points on what we do really, really well. For a contracting officer, here's my contracts. Here's all the things that we've done contractually. We have a BPA with this agency. We have two GSA schedules. We have 8A certification. We're small business. We're women-owned. This, this is how I can help you move that thing off of your desk. So have your position and prop, value proposition ready for the people that are, that are buying. And it's not just your elevator pitch. They may ask you your elevator pitch, but your value proposition is not based on what you sell. It's based on how they buy. 
So then we get into the act as if. Act as if you're already friends, all the things we just talked about. And then give them a choice of two. This is a magical thing for the human brain. And what that means is, is earlier in the week or later in the week better for you? This week or next week? Morning or afternoon? Monday or Tuesday? 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock? The magic that happens from this and the reason why the choice of two works is it forces the, br the brain into thinking of a choice. And we all like choices. We just don't like too many choices. Some people can't handle too many choices. Where if you give them a choice of 10, it's like, oh my gosh, I don't know if I can choose that. My wife, love her. Love her, love her, love her. But if you give her any more than two choices, she is absolutely going to lose her mind. And a lot of times, you just have to say, hey, this, this looks like a really good thing. But she'll, she'll go back and forth between two choices like 16 times. But decision makers don't do that. Decision makers decide. And if you give them a choice or two, this week or next week, they're going to look and say, is this week better or next week? Because guess what? One of those choices isn't no. If you say, are you available next week? That's a yes or no question. If you ask them that question, they're going to give you a yes or no. And if they say no, well, that's not good. But if you say, is this week or next week better for you, they could look at it and say, well, this week is definitely not good. Next week is not the best. The week after that might work because they're in a frame of mind of figuring out what will work, what won't, as opposed to what won't work, in addition to being able to choose. And most of the time, if you give them a choice of two, they will pick one of the choices that you give them. And guess what? One of those choices is good for you. Both of those choices are good for you. If you say, are you available next week, and they kick back, yeah, I can, I, I can do it Monday morning at 9, and you have a, a super-duper meeting at 9 o'clock every Monday, how's that going to work? That's not going to work. So here's where you get into the, the, the buying patterns of everybody. But in this instance, we're talking about a specific person. If you know who you're after and you go after them, give them a choice of two, chances are you're going to come out with something that works. So help where you need it, find the right people. Here's the other thing. You need to make sure your house is in order. If you're not registered with CCR, some of the folks that are new on this call, that's one of those things. If you don't have a GSA, if you're GSA able, um, we highly encourage that. Uh, because it shows people that you, you know how to play in their space. So uh, developing your capabilities, and if you're in construction or, or some of the art, ORCA is another place where you may need to make sure that you're up to date in your certifications. Make sure that if you have the ability to have certifications, women-owned or 8A or whatever they happen to be, that you are service-disabled or just veteran-owned, whatever it happens to be. Make sure that those certifications are in place and recorded properly. So get your message in front of the right people with the right message. Make it easy for them to like you. And a lot of times it's all in the tone, and it's in your expectation that they will. And make it easy for them to buy now, getting back to your GSA schedule and other things. So um, I do want to, before I launch into this, I do want to answer some questions. So let me, let me see if I can bounce out of here for just one minute. And hold on. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Because I want to get to a screen that can help us. Wow, there's way too much here. I think something got duplicated. All right, I'm going to go back to the, to the head of this. I'm going to go bam here, and I'm going to say, oh, yeah. Oh, that's not it. What happened to that? Oh, I know why. Hold on. I did it that time. Let's see. Okay. I do want to answer some questions, and, and Mark, if he's still available, he can also jump in if we need to. Let's see if we have any here. Um, ba -ba. I don't see here. All right. If, you, if you'd like to ask a question, you can raise your hand or, or, or give me a text and let me know that, that, that you'd like to, uh, to ask a question. Um, Let's see. One of the questions is, what does it what does it mean when you can find the right people? Okay, let me let me launch into a little bit of my own personal thing here. I'm going to show you, uh, in essence, a uh, one of the reports. It's a sample report that we do. This is, and it, if you take, if you, I can send this to you, but you can see it's 79 pages long. And as far as fi finding the right people looks like this. We look at a market segment, your market segment, 
and we say, okay, based on NAICS codes, which are your NAICS codes, whatever they happen to be, and also keywords and other things, we, we, want, to form, we want to find them the places where things are being hid because they're not always going under the right NAICS codes. So we're looking for the primary contacts, and this happens to be, it starts with the competitors. I like to start with competitors because competitors, they're buying from your competitors. And if they're doing that, if we figure out how they're doing it, if they're hiding it someplace or popping it up over here or, or um, they just prefer this particular vendor because of a contracting vehicle that they have and we can replicate what they do, then we have the chance to be able to noodle in on some of that business. We also don't want to reinvent the wheel. We want to make sure that we... Um, that we're following what whoever's winning. If you take a look here, $92 million worth of wins in the past two years, that's pretty good money, $93 million. And it, it represents 5.77% of the marketplace, and I'm not sure where this data came from anymore. I can't remember when we did it. But we break it down by two different ways. One is by total wins, and the other is by the number of contracts so that you can start to get an understanding because you're, you're going to develop a sweet spot within these contracts. They may not be the $100 million contracts. You may not be ready to compete for that, but you may be on your way to competing for that and start nailing some of the smaller pieces. I love things that are less than $750,000 in general. The reason being is they don't attract the attention of the big boys, the Northrop's, the Deloitte's, and things like that. Now, some of those are starting to touch down into them because they're, some of their other markets are drying up, so they may go after some of that work. But there's a place for you to be able to be, and that's the, the question is, with your qualifications, what types of contracts and what level of contracts are the easiest for you to win? You don't want to spend time working on something that you can't win. Uh, one of our, our clients came to us last year and said, hey, we, we, bid, we bid on uh, 15. How many did you win? None. Well, you're not bidding in the right place. You're just responding to stuff, and you don't. You and they had a really good proposal writer, and I love him to death, but he's absolutely not going about it the right way. And as a result, they are are they they didn't change the way that they were operating, and now the the company is is now going to be sold, or you know whatever is left of it is 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 going to be disbanded. So then we're looking at the contracting offices that are doing this. These are the agencies, and then we look at. We look at, at their company, your, your company's primary next, but we're also looking at all the other ways. And it's very important to do this because we're trying to figure out how they're actually doing the purchasing. So we do that, but then at the end of the day, when you start talking about the people that are buying from what you do specifically, hold on a second, there's a whole bunch of PSCs here. You start to get to where, where I call the money and that is the people that are actually doing it. Now, in this instance, these are contacts needing small business. Boom, there they are. The number of contracts they've written, the phone number, the email address, all of the pieces that are there, and you cannot find this anyplace else. We have developed the, the intelligence research. Every one of these people are personally researched in order to be able to supply this to you, to make sure that they, are, that, that they have been buying what you sell and that they're reachable. If we can't verify them, and sometimes we can't, if we can't verify them, then we're not going to supply them to you. There's going to be plenty of them, though. So if you look, then they, those are the ones that, are, that need small businesses. Now, what about ones that need small disadvantaged businesses? If you're a disadvantaged business, this is what you want. You also want to know this if you're not a disadvantaged business, because if they are, if they are coming to you and saying, hey, you know, if you can see, they're not buying from small disadvantaged businesses. Okay, that's good. Then we may be able to influence them too, even if we're a large business. So the same thing applies. And if you have the ability to help them, maybe, if you are a disadvantaged business, then this is where you play. But the, the by and large is we're going to supply you with the, the right people for you. This isn't just everybody. Now, they do buy other things. Some of these folks, I mean, you look at Klaus Shannon, I'm guaranteeing it. Klaus bought 20 contracts for $500,000, maybe he was stovepiped in the State Department to buy these certain things, but generally not. He's probably, probably buying pencils and pens and paper and computers and tables and chairs and, and your services. And that's the, that's the piece where that's how we help you find those folks. So does that make sense? And also, by the way, this is all electronic as well, so that the, the key contacts are all capable of being imported into your system 
and there's hundreds of them usually, unless you're very, very niche oriented or you have a very, very small geographic footprint uh, in which we will absolutely help you as well. So, all right, I answered that question, I think. Uh, let's see here. Any other questions? Let's see, chat here. Um, okay. Um, can you get a copy of the presentation? Yes, you can get a copy of the presentation. In fact, we just, we're recording it, and I'm going to post it on YouTube so that you can have that, but we'll also disseminate the, the slides themselves, so we'll be able to do that. And um, how do you get in, how do I get in touch with you? Very good question. Hold on one second. I hate it when people ask me that question. Let's see what I have to, to, to get you here. Establishing the core. Let me get to my, my final screen here. And since it's getting late, um, if you have any more questions, please feel free. You can email those to me. You can give me a call. Um, I will be leaving momentarily after this. I have a meeting, uh, and I'm tied up the rest of the day. But please feel free to give me a call. You can call me on my cell, um, or you can call me in the office and, and leave a message. It doesn't matter. But um, the other places you can, there's other places you can go with isifederal.com. You can go in there and you can you can check out the the components there. That we have some historical com, historical pieces and and also we have news feeds and things like that. And it's pretty funny because I uh, there was a news feed that happened happened last week where um, I have a a proposal in front of a construction firm in in Colorado, and um, I and they do some some solar pieces. Well, it's I, I found crossover between them and a project that they did out in Denver and then and some folks out in in, uh, in North Carolina that I was I was doing a little research for so it is a small world when it comes to this thing so uh, also if you'd like to do LinkedIn you can look me up at ISI federal dot don't have to be dot com ISI federal and, and I'll pop up um, and feel free to, to get me there uh, and, and we'll be glad glad to uh, to do that any um let's see we got another question. Any more questions before I jump? It's it's eleven fifty eight. I'm going to be very. Um, hey Don Flippo's on here. How are you doing, Don? Um, Mark, you still around, or did you yes, bail? Sir. Okay, cool. Any other suggestions for anybody while we're while we're talking? You there? I just wanted to see if you had any final comments before we jump. I, I, I want to have you on to just talk about 8A stuff in the next couple weeks if, or the next couple months if we can because I think that that would be really, really good to know. Um, so I really appreciate the help with that, and thanks for being Johnny on the spot. Um, and if there's any other questions, I'm going to unmute. I'm going to see if anybody else does. i got Crystal, i got Don. Don, you there? Let's see. I recognize some of these folks. So bow. Yeah. If you have any questions, feel free to email them to me, and I'll be glad to uh, to answer those. And and if you'd like to get to talk to Mark, I'm sure he'd be willing to do that too. I'm putting him on the spot again. <laughs> so anyway, with that in mind, I'm going to jump because I have to get to a meeting in a half an hour, and um, and I still have something I have to do. So. Uh, but it was great having everybody. I'm glad that you could make it. We're going to do it again next month, and um, and we'll keep everybody posted on on the progress and and with, with what's happening with the budget cuts in in September. And don't be afraid because there's opportunity in cuts too. So let's see what we can do to help you reach those. Well, thank you so much, and I do appreciate it. We will we'll talk to you next month. Take care, Dave. Hey, thanks, Mark. Uh, you're welcome. Bye bye. Okay, bye.